as a musician and podcaster, protecting my hearing is crucial to what I do. D-Bud are the best earplugs I've ever come across. They are volume adjustable, which is crucial when you're making music, and they're incredibly effective at filtering noise at the right level, giving you the hearing protection you need whilst retaining the clarity of the sound you're exposed to. And check out D-Bud's volume adjustable earplugs. They're amazing. Um, good question. I mean, um, to tell you the truth, it's probably my dad uh, singing to us, uh, me and my sister, in bed at night time, you know, when we were putting us to bed. He used to sing all these old uh, songs, you know, from the 40s and 50s and um, kind of cinematic to a young mind, you know. Uh, a lot, a lot of American stuff, which which would have probably come into a, into Liverpool from the boats and stuff, you know. And then uh, having a sister a few years older than me, she kind of started buying seven inch records before I did. So she'd have like the the stuff from the early seventies, like um, uh, Sweet and Slade and T Rex and. Um, you know, my, my one of my favourites was um, I Hear You Knocking by Dave Edmonds, you know, which uh, really was like a great slice of rhythm blues, you know, old blues song by Smiley Lewis. But, mm. yeah. and, and would you say that some of this music influenced you in terms of what, what you went on to do? Yes, I, I would do, especially someone like Dave, Dave Edmonds. Um, you know, he's somebody who's very um, always connected with the roots of where it all came from, you know, and uh, he never veered too far away from the initial uh, thing of what it was, you know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty much like that myself, you know. I mean, I like all different types of music, but the kind of stuff that I do is, is very, very kind of um, grounded in rock and roll, rockabilly, blues stuff, you know, country. Mm. And and when did you start making music yourself? Well, uh, I actually got on stage first um, doing my words, speaking my poems and stuff and, you know, ranting away, you know. And then um, I realised I really wanted to be in a band so uh, I relied on other people to make the music and I was doing the, the words and the singing and stuff. And, um, and then eventually I uh, learned to play the guitar in about, I was about 23, so quite late coming to it really, you know. And uh, I still use the guitar really as a um, songwriting implement. Um, I... <laughs> uh, I use proper guitarists to play on my on my songs, you know, but, but but they but they come from my chords and my arrangements, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so you were twenty three when you when you first learned it. Yeah. And how did you learn it? Did you just play along to records, or did you? Um... I, I had a, a friend who had a spare guitar. Um, and he lent it to me, an old battered Spanish guitar, you know, and that was enough for me to learn an E chord and an A chord and a B7. That's what normally happens. You learn three chords and then you learn the D and the C and the G and there's another three chords and and then you learn the minors um, after the majors. And then uh, uh, eventually I, I, um, I learned, you know, I mean, I, I learned writing my own songs rather than learning anyone else's songs. I... Um, and that's what I still do that to, to be honest you know uh, I, I don't know many other people's songs I'm not somebody you can just pick up and start jamming along I'm, a, I'm much more of a, of, of a composer you know uh, of songs Do you recall the first time that you wrote a song? Yeah I do it was called Trees and Plants and it was about the environment um, it's still valid to this day more than ever it's, it's accessibility, which um, gave it blanket coverage across the world, you know, and across, across the globe. It, was, it doesn't have to be complicated. And nothing I do is, is that complicated. Like, you know, so. Yeah, it's, it, the, the best things 
assemble things um you know not only in music often but in, in life and uh, there's a tendency to overcomplicate uh, but you know does your songwriting process since that first occasion that you wrote a song um has it changed at all or, or is it usually something relatively similar do you sit down with the intention of writing a song or do songs come to you because this is always something that's so different depending on the person that i talk to yeah i think i think what's um I always feel that I, I have to have an initial emotive trigger for something to come out, which is worth anything, you know, something which is, uh, you know, where, where I'm triggered by something emotionally. Um, and then I decide that I want to ex express my feelings about it. And then, but, but it, it all has to be from there onwards. Um, I think to sit down and go, I, I'm going to write a song or something. It always feels contrived. The, these days, what, what are the type of things that that would, uh, you know, set off that type of trigger for you? Um, <clears throat> the last song, one one of the more recent songs I wrote was um, called "Shoot Me in the Head If I Ever Become One of Them," which is like a country song, uh, but it's also it's very it's very very true, and it's about um, the, st <laughs> the 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 people who are. Um, leading the show at the moment should we say you know and uh, you know so uh, the leading leading the show where in in, in the u.s in the country in the, in the country in the u.s in the world at the moment you know it, it, it's uh you know just put the news on you know what i'm talking about you know mm -hmm. uh you know people who um who think it's appropriate to give you know a couple of apples and a couple of yoga cartons to kids to live on for a week you know that kind of thing you know, that, you know yeah yeah you know the the, the legitimization of that um so that was you know just one one example i've also done a single um not so long ago of the um photographer and filmmaker mark mcnulty is doing a video for it at the moment it's called beating a path to your door and that's just their heads down um kind of rockabilly bopper you know um and we've done a video shot around here where i live in uh, snowdonia national park wow. um down the trails and through the woods and stuff you know wow when does that come out well it was going to come out last year but obviously everything's gone up in the air because of the um the way the world's changed you know so um he's finishing it off at the moment so uh, uh the video and then, so i'll release it simultaneously probably on Bandcamp or and um other digital outlets um when the video is finished so if you're watching mark get your finger out lads <laughs> and, and so is Bandcamp something that you think is a good solution to to the kind of woes faced by um, many artists. Um, I know it's a platform like a lot of the music that Bandcamp promote and their sort of curation is really good from, from what I've seen. Um, I've discovered some great things on Bandcamp. Um, and obviously there's been this recent whole, you know, debate. I think it was in the House of Commons or something like that. They, well, in any case, Guy Garvey and a, and a bunch of other artists basically went and campaigned against the fact that Spotify don't pay artists much. Um, do you think things like Bandcamp might be able to help the situation or, or, or is the situation something that you've come to accept or, or do you feel um, outraged by? Well, you know what? Um, it's only recently that I've put my catalogue up on Bandcamp. Um, uh, so they're all available now digital format and there's also a link which is going to be going up this weekend to buy the physical um album itself normally on cd or vinyl you know mainly C cds and uh, uh so for those old people like me who, who like who don't think it's real unless there's there's an actual <laughs> object in their hands you know but um <laughs> but yeah the world's the world's changed immensely hasn't it and um i think it's absolutely criminal what happens um where people just i mean music's free now isn't it you know which is a great thing uh, in many ways the accessibility but the people who are making the music um really should be given 
a larger piece of the pie than they're getting because at the moment they're not even getting a slither you know and the people who are making vast amounts of money vast amounts of money off other people's creativity really and um i'd i'd I don't know how it's come to this. I mean, you know, I saw, I think it was Niall Rogers, you know, the big star like talking about it the other day. And he's going, well, since, since I've lost my, um, my income as a live performer because of the restriction, um, you know, I, I should be able to get something off, off all these millions and millions of streams that he's getting. And I'm thinking, well, Boy, if you can't get anything, you know, how's someone like me who's like a kind of an independent artist going to get on top of this, you know? Uh, so mm. we'll, we'll have to lobby for it. We'll have to fight as, as, as always, you know, and uh, but more than ever, musicians are desperate to actually get something out of the uh, digital li- uh, streaming because there ain't no other way to make anything at the moment because they were re- relying on on the gigs, weren't they? You know, and, and that's all dried up for God knows how long, so. What do you think of the statement made by, I think his name is Daniel Eck, the CEO of Spotify, that if you don't like how much you're getting paid by Spotify, then make some more music? Well, I think it's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life, quite frankly. At least, you know, I mean... He just sounds like a bit of a twat, really, doesn't he? Yeah, an unbelievable twat who's, you know, made so much money himself. And it's not a solution. Well, these people, these people haven't got a creative bone in their bodies, somebody who can say that, you know. Um, they have no idea what it takes, the stealth, um, how deep people have to dig to have the right to be a performer, to, to get a band together, to write songs, to express the, themselves, then to afford the equipment and then to afford the petrol to go somewhere, to get a gig. And uh, they got no idea because they've never done it, you know? Um, so, yeah. but they have, you know, we're getting back to what I was talking about before, aren't we? you know, these people who are just uh, totally... They live in a kind of parallel universe and somehow hold the keys. <laughs> and I don't know how, you know, but... What was, what was the title person. of this? What was the title of the song that you wrote about this? Don't Let Me Become One of Them. Shoot Me in the Head If I Ever Become One of Them. Shoot Me in the Head If I Ever Become One of Them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm I looking forward to... It. I mean it. I'm looking forward to listening to that, to, to that song after this podcast. It is. It's, that's on Bandcamp. I did a recording in this room with um, my son who's a lot more competent than I am with um, recording uh, f- f- facilities, Ray, Ray Badger. He's a, he, uh, he's a great guitarist. He plays guitar on it as well and uh, kind of produced it and got that kind of weird retro echoey 50s, 19, early 60s, late 50s kind of country sound that, I, that I'm so fond of. Yeah, it's, it's a great sound. And, and so, you know, if you don't want to become one of them, and, and, you know, we all know who, who you're referring to, and it's referring to, to so many different people and so many different kind of um, sets of principles that are just not right. Um, but is there anybody in kind of public life or political life or, um, you know, from the business world who you do respect and who you do think presents a way forward for humanity or for the creative industries? Or do you think all of these positions of power are currently held by people who don't have the best interests of independent artists and well, indeed, you know, just general citizens at, at, at their heart? Well, I was brought up on the, um, you know, I, I was 15 in 1977, which was a fantastic age to be at that time. Uh, when punk rock hit, you know, and it was all do it yourself, you know, don't, don't rely on these people, you know, they don't understand what it's about, you know, and, and like the whole punk rock ethos DIY is very much where I'm still at. And um, a lot of people who I know, like my contemporaries are the same. And, um, and Sometimes, you know, I mean, I've had success with with things probably at the most least likely times when you're expecting it. But um, so I do have an through music one way and another. But um, 
it's never been the way you kind of projected it was going to be when you were younger and you were going to kind of, you know. Um, so, I mean, of course, there's, there's people, there's fantastic people in the music business in the past who have done great things and um, they've had a real passion. They've, 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 they've been music lovers, though, you know. The being, you know, the, it always works when it's people who, who have a passion for music and and owns it. Uh, but all that after after the um, the punk rock wars, new wave going through in the eighties and into the nineties, and then everything kind of really became a lot more um, corporate because a lot of the independent labels were swallowed up by bigger corporations, and they kind of missed the point of what it was about in the first place, you know, and then. And then it just be kind of the inevitable product to come out of that evolvement um, of the corporate ideal is what you hear on the radio now, which um, far be it for me to criticise any other artist because I, I don't believe in that. But a great deal of it is what can only be described as saccharine and um, very overproduced and um, very kind of antiseptic you know, um, the grit and the sweat and the stuff which makes it human anymore, you know? That's my that's my, my own view for what it's worth, you know? So. Yeah, well, it does seem like things are very airbrushed now. It's quite hard to make something kind of stand out sufficiently or be big enough, you know? It, it, it sounds like, you know, you're in a lot of, music in the charts now is just so big because of the technology as in sonically like it's like you're sitting in sitting in the cinema and they've got all that dramatic music that comes on with uh, with their amazing sound system and it just reminds me of that like the bass is just so huge and the electronic drums are so in time and and the singing has been so finely tuned that every single last breath is in the right exact pitch down to the last you, do you know what i mean it's just and then, and then you stick on something. I've got a theory. On. It's my my theory on what you're talking about is that um, <clears throat> is that in the 1980s or up, up, up until the 1980s, really, I, I I tend to believe that producers were there to be servants to the artists. If you look at Joe, for instance, he was there. He was the perfect producer for the perfect band because he was he he was there to manifest the vision and the sound of those of those people and then as we went on through the 70s that still it still existed and then when we got into the 80s and you get the techno the technological shift then into a much bigger sound and and um, that you're talking about and um, gated reverbs and everything became like synth a lot more synthetic music and technology came in and and uh, you know people used it very well with uh, with with electronic music and stuff but um, all of a sudden it was like it's not going to get a, get on the radio unless this guy's produced it do you know so it wasn't about the band anymore it's about the producer so then the band then became slaves to the producer and the sound which they want because the record company knows is not going to get played on the radio unless this guy is going to make it sound like this. And we are now in 2022, 2021, sorry, I'm always a year, year ahead of, my, <laughs> of the game. Uh, and, um, and look, you know, the way, the way, I mean, there is, there is good, good music out there, but uh, it, it the contemporary music I hear on, on mainstream radio, at least in the daytime, um, isn't something that particularly floats my boat, you know? Mm. So, uh, yeah, I'd say uh, producers should really be servants to the artists. That's because very, without very the artists, there's, there's nothing in the first place, you know? But sometimes at the moment, and, you know, I don't know whether this is a big change because... I guess there have always been things like this historically in the music industry, but is it the case that nowadays, you know, sometimes you're getting acts who kind of made their made their name as like a, a social media star or a or a you know a famous personality, and they don't actually have that much musical training, so they need to be paired with the producer, and the producer needs to kind of call the shots because 
a lot of the time these artists don't have any musical yeah. training at all or, or not even training but they they had they don't want to like pick up a guitar or a piano or whatever they just well, want to like, do the, they look, the studio. they look good and they accidentally were in the right place at the right time in a certain tv show or yeah i mean that's very much what it is i mean there was always an element to that in pop music going right yeah. back to the late 50s you know but um you, you know you know i'm not kind of completely against that because I think most people have a some modicum of talent if if it's if if it's given a platform and they can actually uh, get to exhibit it. So you know, um, and as I said before, I'm I know how hard it is to be in a band. I've done it a long, long time, and to produce music and what you're up against. So I'm I'm never going to kind of diss people out of hand on 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 um, on that basis. But it does seem that. Um, you know, soap stars like Kylie and Jason Donovan and all that, yeah, they, they all came about from, you know, from being in a, you know, a soap in Australia. And it's, um, and look, you know, she's one of the biggest stars in the world now, isn't she, Kylie? You know, it, it's just... Uh, I didn't realise that she was You know, talent helps, soap. right? <laughs> but it's certainly not um, famous or successful. Yeah, yeah. That's it, it's interesting um, to what extent that's changed or, or not changed. I, I don't know, um, but yeah, it's it's kind of interesting to consider. Is there any music that comes out now, any contemporary music that does excite you? Well, you know, I'll be honest with you. Most most of the stuff I I, I listen to is um, rockabilly and country music, George Jones, and I love all this kind of stuff. You know, uh, rock and bones. That's a great a c collection of 1950s punk and uh, punk rockabilly. Um, you know, um, I, I mean, I do, I do like all different types of music, uh, but I just keep on going back to that initial um, spot and also something which is, is mentioned very much of it is the, the Native American influence in, um, in the origins of rock and roll as well, which is, you know, immense. So, you know, all these people, they had, you know, uh, Cherokee grandparents, you know, Elvis and Chuck Berry and Muddy Waters and Little Richard and Dolly Parton. You know, you you mentioned them, you know, Woody Guthrie, Jimi Hendrix, you know, they all, you know, and uh, so it, it was never really a black and white thing. It You know, uh, it was much more of a, a kind of continental uh equation really that that made it and um i love the dynamism of that but i mean it, uh that was still still alive very much i mean just putting four people in a room and making music together is yeah. the best thing in the world it's the best thing in the world and no amount of multi-tracking is ever going to um create that uh energy which is, you know, and I, I must sound like a real Luddite and somebody who, <laughs> you know, but I, I, I just think if, it, you know, if it ain't bust, don't fix it, you know, and, and if you can do it like that, you know, Mike Badger and the Shady Trio, we did two albums, um, my most recent albums, and they were all recorded live in the studio, even the vo even, even the vocal, you know, we might put some backing vocals on later, that, and that was it, you know, and... Uh, and it's a great know, way of doing it. Well, it's it's perfect, and not everybody can do it now because they've forgotten how um, how to perform. How many they they, they have auto tune and they have, you know and they have all these things which which shear through it and 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 render it like sterile. Yeah, it, you know? it does render it sterile. How many big performers who you see in like arenas? Do you reckon if you were to get them into the local pub on a kind of open mic night, no auto tune, no fancy stage, and just yeah. make them play, how many of them do you think would cut the mustard? If it was someone like Prince, you know he's yeah. going to come up with the shit, you know. <laughs> um, there's a great deal of other, um, you know, artists who, um, I, you know what, it's not, it's not really a field I'm qualified to talk about because I don't, I don't really, you know, go to those gigs. I don't know who 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 sells all these tickets. I don't know those 
those people really but you know um i know that you know uh there's some very very talented people out there who arenas you know and they go oh, for sure through stealth again you know you know so i don't want to be dismissive of people but um you know it's um it has been made very, very easy for some people with an absolute modicum of talent to become superstars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's inter- it's interesting. I mean, I guess it's always like the marketing and the and the luck and different things have always kind of played a part in who's you know music's like a superstar market like no other. Um, as as I kind of keep yeah. keep hearing, um, what what are your kind of hopes for uh, you know this year with regards to know maybe getting getting back out there and being able to play live at some point coronavirus permitting well yeah you know um i did i did three gigs last year um and (laughs) it was it was quite strange it well i'm the sorry it was the year before think thinking about it the last one i did was in barcelona in february just under a year ago and that was for the Liverpool Signing Choir, which has now become the European Signing Choir for the deaf. And I, I was commissioned to buy them to write a song. Um, and so we went over and we debuted it in Barcelona, which was fantastic. And we played some of my own stuff as well. The one before that was um, in Klein Roost Social Club here, just about 10 miles down the road middle of the Con- Conway Valley and that was just a bit of an open mic thing which I hadn't played around here since I've moved here to Snow- Snowdonia National Park you know and that was that was a real hoot that was a great gig and the one before that was in um, Stockholm in a venue called Twang which was a, uh, a record store in the basement underneath this cafe uh, sorry, a, a guitar shop, and they put the grills in front of all the guitars, and then they make a venue, and it's got this stage. It was fan- fantastic. Well, my last three gigs were three of the best gigs I've ever done, but they were like kind of six months apart, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, and um, and that's the way it's been. And when was much more active in Liverpool with the band. And when I moved out here, it was harder to keep the band together. Obviously, they've all got jobs and. You know, I mean, but I was luck, lucky enough to play with some of the finest musicians in in Liverpool, as far as I'm concerned, at, in my field of what I do. You know, uh, Ian Laney on drums, Chris Marshall, double bass, amazing. Paul Commander on guitar, Barry Southern on, on guitar before Paul. Um, these are stunning musicians, they're absolutely top draw. If they were in Nashville, you know, they'd be like, everybody would be clamoring to uh, to get to play with them. But lucky enough, it, it's a, for, for me at least, um, you know, we play for about seven years together, you know. But get, getting back to your point about the future, I mean, nobody knows what the future's going to be now. It's it's like it's it's before and after COVID-19, isn't it? You know? The whole, yeah. whole world is, and it always will be. Um, and uh, let's just hope it's not all negative and it's not all bad and that people reflect on their lives more and, and appreciate who they are and what they are, what they have, you know, and, um, you know, but it is really, 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 really tough on the um, British musicians now, especially because of the whole ridiculous uh, Brexit, stuff that touring happened. thing. We, yeah, we're going to Europe and the carnets and the bureaucracy and everything before was just um, so easy. I mean, the people who are who are probably going to be least affected by it are the people who have the sponsors and the people who have um, the big corporate backing who are going to do it anyway. But the smaller bands, I mean, we we broke in by going to play in Germany, you know, with the onset, which my, the band I was in after the Lars, you know, we, you know, those tours that we did in Germany and, and we actually experienced the fall of the Berlin Wall, you know, we went to Berlin just before wow. it fell and just afterwards. And they were monumental times as well. And But the fact that we could do that and, you know, we got treated so well over there by, by the people in Germany and 
you know, we got paid, we got beer, we got food, we got accommodation. You know, here, you you know, you'd be lucky if you got around at the end of the night, you know, off, off the, you know. Um, yeah, different philosophy. You know, so the UK has an immense, immense pedigree when it comes to rock and roll, only rivaled by America and where it started, you know. Yeah. And um, to think that, you know, they are being thrown under the tour bus, really. Yeah, yeah. And so is there any kind of hope that, that they'll manage to sort it out? Well, uh, you know, um, trying times, um, you, you look throughout history, they always um, create interesting antidotes, <laughs> you know, because the alternative is is to do nothing. And um, that's not an option for an artist because he's, you know, he or she isn't an artist unless they're active and productive and um, enterprising and try and uh, do stuff, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. It, it's, it's pretty shocking. Um, but from that might be the very thing that we need to, you know, kick ass again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, out of, out of adversity, um, you know, sometimes can come great things. Uh, yeah. I do feel for everybody who's struggling out there um, at the moment because it is an unbelievably yeah. difficult environment. Um, but on, on a more uplifting note to, 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 to finish off the, the the podcast, I wanted to know, you know, because you're talking you're talking about some of the great kind of pioneers from from America, mm -hmm. rockabilly, which obviously then spawned so so much great music and inspired so much great music. Um, as this is the greatest music of all time podcast, you know, off the top of your head, who would be some of the some of the characters who you know from that genre who who you think are, are among the greatest and whose music you know has the most meaning to you well there's so many of them because i'm a real big big fan and i know an awful lot of through digging deeper an, an awful lot of very obscure artists who who um probably should have been a lot more of a household name than they actually were you know i mean there's the greats like hank williams for instance, who um, very, very simple again, but just couldn't help but write in a damn fine tune and with a wonderful sense sentiment in it. And uh, so, I mean, he, he, he was a real kind of um, game changer for me personally. Um, everybody for different reasons. Little Richard for having the most intergalactic vocal cords that, that ever existed, you know? Elvis for just being the most charismatic and, um, you know, all the Beatles, massive Elvis fans. Everybody was Elvis fan. You know, without Elvis, there's no Beatles, there's no Stones, there's no, you know, um, Chuck Berry for being the poet laureate of rock and roll. You know, every single one of his songs is is a film. It's a book with chapters and verses, you know, and it's done so eloquently. And then, you know, uh, I love uh, Red Foley, who's like a kind of a country pioneer. He's just somebody who really, really does it for me. Uh, when it comes to the king of rockabilly is probably Charlie Feathers who, uh, when I heard him in um, the early 80s, uh, the Rockabilly Night I used to go down to and that, and um, I mean, it was just like, wow, you know, that guy had rhythm. And, um, and you know, he's a white guy who got it from watching the black guys playing in the streets, you know, in Memphis and Beale Street and stuff. Um, and, uh, but, you know, they were all very poor. They were all poor people, you know, and it was a, it was a salvation, you know, from from the hardships uh, of of living in the southern states and stuff. And um, uh, Johnny Burnett and the Rock and Roll Trio, I mean, another Memphis 
band who are just dynamite. And if anybody really hasn't checked them out, you know, it's like they were they they were in school with Elvis. You know, he was they were who, who Elvis would would have called the Scallies. You know, <laughs> you know the you know the Hard Knocks. They were boxers and and um, you know. Um, but God, they knew what they were doing. It was like punk rock in 1956, but they could all play, you know, as well. Um, Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. I, and of course, one of my ultimate favorites is uh, of all time who wrote the 60s before they happened is Buddy Holly, you know, and, um, you know, Buddy was just. Um, I mean, he he did write the sixties, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, and he died in nineteen fifty nine. Yeah, at the age of twenty two. Really tragic. Oh, it's just heartbreaking. And uh, but the, you know, just get his greatest hits if you want to, you know, you know, you'll keep it forever. And because they're timeless, timeless songs, coming from a really good place, you know, and um, so all those people. Uh, but, you know, I'm not just stuck there. I do like different... I mean, I love the modern lovers, Jonathan Richman and the modern lovers, but he's somebody who's, again, who's really kind of rootsy kind of vibe to it. The, the, the modern lovers uh, album was recorded in 1972, but didn't come out till 1976 and was like a big in influence on the punks. And that is just an incredible album. And I love all Jonathan stuff. Um, and... Uh, who else? I mean, I, you know, my sister had all the David Bowie and Neil Young albums when I was growing up. So, I mean, I, that's all part of who, who I am as well. Um, what, what's the book it, called? It's called The Rhythm and the Tide, and it's co-written with Tim Peacock, um, who is a music journalist who writes for Record Collector and starts at Sounds. And, and um, you did an interview with me, and then it ended up, evolving into this three-year project where we we um we we were eventually got this pub published on um liverpool Un university press and um it's about my story in the creative fields you know going back born in the 60s and you know ended up where we are now in the um new millennium this episode is brought to you by Dbud. Dbud make a product that is pretty much the first that I can actually tolerate and use when I'm recording podcasts, when I'm making music, uh, even when I need to filter out noise when I'm sleeping. It can be quite noisy in this house during lockdown. So honestly, a huge recommendation for everybody listening to this. Go to earlabs.co and check out Dbud's volume adjustable earplugs. If you're enjoying the greatest music of all time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridland YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.